in the last 24 hours, bringing the total now so notified to 1664 1664. Uh, of those 1664, 694 of those deaths occurred in the hospital environment, that's 42%. Easy to occur in intensive care, that's 4.9%. 1501 we reports of underlying mortality conditions of 19.2%. Male female breakdowns 822 males, 842 females, median age is 84, and the mean age is 81. In terms of intensive care, we've got 410 admissions to date, 36 people as of this morning remaining in intensive care, no admissions in the last 24 hours, and 144 people overall in hospital uh, as of 2 p.m. today. Uh, uh, with COVID-19. In terms of incident cases notified to midnight, 2nd of June, Tuesday night, at that point, 25,104, 3,311 have been hospitalised at some point, that's 13.2%, 410 have been admitted to intensive care, that's 1.6%, uh, 32% 30, are healthcare workers, male female breakdown is as before, 43% male, 57% female, and the median age is 48. And briefly, in respect to clusters in residential care facilities, we have unchanged number at 472, and 258 of which are in uh, nursing homes also unchanged. The number of cases identified associated with those clusters now stands at 6,725, increasing 22 in respect to residential care facilities, 5,184 are in respect of nursing home residents, an increase of 40. Uh, in terms of deaths, uh, we're now in the country, sorry, 1,056, 1056, notified in respect of residents of residential care facilities, so that's 63.5% overall, and 924 in respect of nursing home residents, so that's 55.5% of all deaths. And then briefly in respect of uh, healthcare workers, an uh, analysis as of Saturday night just gone, uh, at that point, 8,018 8, cases that account for 31.6% of all cases at that point. 302 of them were hospitalised, giving a hospitalisation rate of 3.8%. 44 have been admitted at some point to intensive care, giving an intensive care admission rate of 0.5%. And the, uh, the number of people who are healthcare workers who have died still stands at 7, unchanged from last week at 0.1%. So, uh, Philip, in respect to Okay, so um, the, the, the situation this week remains one of a very low incidence and prevalence of uh, COVID-19 in, in Ireland and many markers of the disease are continuing to decline. Uh, I'll go through these very quickly because you've seen these charts uh, last week and, and the situation this week is that the numbers are lower uh, than they were last week. So this is uh, confirmed cases by day of confirmation, in other words, the number of cases that were confirmed each day uh, at this briefing. Um, to find uh, the number of deaths uh, confirmed per day uh, also reducing. Um, if we look at the number of new cases detected per day by the day the swab was taken, um, again at, at unprecedentedly low levels, uh, and at this stage, uh, even though there is still uh, transmission of the disease in isolated cases, households and within families, uh, it's at very low numbers uh, in the order of uh, a dozen to 20 uh, new cases per day emerging in those contexts. Uh, so we're, we're seeing a slow decline in, in cases in all settings, uh, uh, a slow decline at very low levels. Uh, we're obviously watching uh, the, the number of deaths per day, um, looking back over the full course of the epidemic, we're now at very low numbers, as you appreciate from uh, these briefings, um, and very low numbers of deaths in uh, residential or congregated settings at this point. Um, you're all aware uh, that, that not only are the numbers in the hospital uh, low, but the numbers of admissions to hospital have now been in single figures, um, for, for two weeks uh, in terms of both admissions uh, to hospital and numbers of people in hospital and in terms of admissions to intensive care uh, um, and numbers of people in intensive care. Um, this is a table that I've uh, shown for the last several weeks. So each Wednesday, uh, we look back on the average of the key indicators over the preceding five days and, and take the average. Uh, and this demonstrates to us that each week 
and uh, the incidence and prevalence of the disease is lower than the preceding week. You see in red what we what the highest levels were back in April. And so this week, on average, we're looking at uh, 48 new cases being confirmed each day compared with their almost 60 last week. We're looking at, on average, over the last week, there have been 178 people in hospital. It's now down to 144, and that was almost 300 the preceding week. Uh, we are looking at uh, fewer than 10 admissions uh, per day to hospital, uh, 5 compared to 10 last week. Uh, the, the number of people in intensive care is lower. It's, it's slower to decline for, for complex clinical reasons, but it still is uh, 37 this week compared to uh, 50 um, last week. Admissions per day down to, down to 1 on average, and the number of deaths confirmed per day uh, down to 1. With such low prevalence of disease, therefore, we've been monitoring the reproduction number uh, of this disease, the effective reproduction number in our society uh, for several weeks now. And the number of cases gets very, very low. It's very difficult to estimate uh, how the disease is spreading uh, in the population. So it, it, it's good news that it's hard to estimate what the reproduction number is. Um, we've, we, we still are confident uh, that it is significantly below one. So the measures that people have taken to ensure when they are coming in contact with other people that they're not transmitting the virus remain effective. Um, it's possible um, that the reproduction number is a little bit higher this week than it was the last week. If that's the case, it's marginal. And as I say, it's difficult to estimate under these circumstances. So we're looking at a reproduction number somewhere between 0.4 and 0.7, uh, safely below one. Uh, our best estimate of what was last week is, is around 0.6, um, uh, and we're, we're confident that it, is, it remains uh, significantly below 1. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Tony Richard Chambers from Virgin Media News. Uh, just in terms of method and recommendation about moving to phase 2, as occurred for the last number of days, that we're very much on course for that. Has there been any second thoughts at this point, or so no. that's good? No second thoughts. So we've made uh, a series of uh, advices available to the Minister and through the Minister will be made available to Cabinet so we'll tomorrow to consider that advice in relation to what measures will be taken. Um, but we think in broad disease terms, we're at the point at which we can make that advice and guidance available to Government. We'll wait and see what the Government decides tomorrow. Now, the Environment said that he's pitched moving some of the elements of Phase 3 into Phase 2, particularly around uh, retailers, larger non-essential retailers, moving them if they have street access into phase two. Do you feel like NEF is under pressure from the government and from different business groups, different lobby groups, to try and speed things up? Do you think that's inappropriate? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't think that we're, not, we're, we're under pressure in relation to that. It's a public health assessment and I can take the basis from our point of view that informs any of the advice and guidance that we make available. And insofar as we recommend a set of measures to government, whatever that might be, it is entirely, as far as we are concerned, on public health grounds. There are other decisions then that have to be, or other considerations, I should say, that have to be given to uh, any given set of measures other than just public health ones by, by government. Uh, but our role and our responsibility is to make public health assessments and advice and guidance available. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we've done again on this occasion. Just in terms of what, what Virgin Media News understands from the government, uh, in terms of retailers opening out in phase two next Monday, in terms of the travel restriction of 20 kilometers, that only applying to the end of the month. Are there no health concerns about that? Because we speak to. I think the government decisions in relation to that are due tomorrow. Cabinet hasn't met yet. Yeah. Uh, there's one more, just in terms of you might have seen uh, various airlines have been pitching over the past few days and advertising and saying that targeting customers saying that flights to Spain and Portugal are back up and running from next month. You've heard um, people from, from Aer Lingus have said that they want to see the quarantine two weeks scratch for people arriving in this country. And do you think it's appropriate for airlines to be targeting customers, telling them to essentially book flights for a summer holiday at this point? Uh, I think what we are advising the public to do is to listen to our public health advice in relation to non-essential travel and it remains at this moment in time unchanged. Uh, we're advising against non-essential travel from the islands, in other words, people leaving here on holidays and then having to come back uh, to the kinds of arrangements that will pertain here in terms of people coming back uh, from abroad. And we're advising people who are uh, contemplating coming here for non-essential reasons, tourist reasons and so on, that now is not the time to do that. So your message to will be hold off, don't yes. on holiday. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
only 40. I see the UK are talking about bringing in mandatory face masks on public transport from the 15th of June. I was just wondering, is that anything that you are giving more consideration to in terms of actually making it mandatory? Uh, no, um, we've given consideration to that specific question and we have not advised uh, on mandatory use of face masks in any particular setting, although public transport is one of the settings which we have advised that uh, the wearing of face masks is something that people should do, should consider. We do provide in our advice for the reality that the evidence is not absolutely clear uh, and we also provide, provide for the fact that for each individual uh, it either may not be possible um, for, for that individual for various reasons uh, to wear a face mask. Um, uh, so it's, an, it's advice about well, it's something that we're going to mandate. Thank you. And just one other question, please, and it might be more Dr. Flynn, but yesterday you gave us papers on the Roma community and uh, people in drug provision and so on. Has there been any breakdown of other ethnicities and how they are suffering from COVID or indeed people who are dying? I know, again, in other countries, maybe with a large population, there seems to be an impact on the AME population. So has there been any research like that done here? There, there hasn't today, but I know the NHC is planning to look at that in more detail uh, over, the coming, over the coming weeks uh, to collect that information, to look at it. For, for now, they just focus on the community, on the, on the populations and the communities as I listed out yesterday. Uh, but there is, a, there is an intention to look at it in more detail over the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just again, on the, the sort of pressure that seems to be building around the the acceleration of you know, easing restrictions from the teacher saying some things could be brought forward. Uh, also, I like this morning saying we're in one of the most conservative lockdowns still across all of Europe. Is there not a, a really growing case now to bring the August 10th deadline uh, forward into July 20th? Uh, I, I, I'm aware, uh, obviously, of those calls in various different sectors, and we understand them. As I said already, our assessments of all these things are based on public health considerations. Uh, I'd like to think on an ongoing basis that we're open to the possibility that where evidence and experience in other countries suggests we should make changes, that we would make those changes and give consideration to all of that and made that advice available to government uh, and government's going to consider that and make clear what the response to that will be tomorrow. Okay. Um, uh, again, the teacher saying uh, elements of phase four, we move to phase three. Is there anything you can see in phase four that you would be open to consider moving forward, such as the 20 kilometre restriction zone coming forward, would you consider that? So we've given, as I say, consideration to all of those questions today, and that has made a number of uh, uh, decisions in respect of the advice that we should give government uh, on all of those issues, um, and government will make that clear tomorrow. Uh, some people were surprised to hear the teacher characterise it as he was uh, making proposals to NEFIT. Uh, did that kind of characterisation surprise you, that the teacher was proposing things to NEFIT? No. Is that how the process will work in your view? I think it's perfectly reasonable that that core advice and guidance might be needed, uh, and where there's a value in having that guidance and advice available, uh, that we'd be asked to make advice and guidance available. I think that's our role, it's our function to provide that advice in relation to public health matters. Okay, thanks. Okay. Rob Lanner, I'm Joe Lee. Can I ask, just I, I know it was being considered by NEFA today about the potential for testing, not only close contacts, but secondary and tertiary contact, contacts uh, of confirmed cases. Is there anything in that? So, secondary and tertiary contacts? So, confirmed cases? Yes, yeah, so rather than just testing close contacts of confirmed cases, testing their contacts, the contacts of the contacts. No, that hasn't been that informed by our consideration. No. no, no, I asked the question earlier, you said it was being discussed by NEFA on that Thursday. Uh, well, if, if, if that was the question you asked, we were on different wavelengths. It was never part of our consideration that contacts of contacts would be treated as though they were contacts. It still remains the case that we describe a contact, a close contact, as somebody who has contacts with a confirmed case and various different categories with, with a known case of the disease. If a person has contact with another person who had contact with that person, but that person themselves does not have the disease, we do not consider them close contacts. We don't require them to subject themselves to the, the self-isolation. We don't require them to be tested in the way that we do now with contacts and so on. So, so there's no plan to move towards that? No. no. And, and can I ask uh, Professor Nolan, just you mentioned that when the number of cases are low, it's, kind of, it's hard to gauge the, the OR number. Is it possible then to see, to, that we would maybe not see the significant move we would expect, if that makes sense? So is it harder to gauge the OR number and therefore harder to gauge the potential rise? 
the best way to think about it is it's hard to gauge it with precision. Um, uh, if, if there was a resurgence of disease, in other words, increased spread of the disease, we begin to see that an increased number of cases first, and then see it as an estimate of the increase in reproduction numbers. So the, the emphasis right now, for lots of reasons, has to be on what is the number of cases. That's the most reassuring piece of news that we have here. Uh, the fact that that makes the reproduction number a little bit unreliable doesn't matter on that so long as the total number of cases remains so low. Thank you. Thanks. Well, then, yeah, a few quick questions. Um, obviously, there's going to be some loosening uh, of measures next week. Is the advice, the general advice, still to stay at home, not travel, not don't make unnecessary changes? Is that still the advice in spite of the open up of shops and so on? So we're still in phase one. And so right now, that's still the advice from next, from next week, phase two, we provide for, for different advice. And they set all that out once the government makes its decisions. So it won't be. So at a point in time, we will flip from having a, a largely stay at home message uh, to a different public health message. We will set all that out once we have decisions made by government tomorrow. Basically, you're say that, that wasn't defined when the roadmap was set out uh, originally. What, what wasn't defined? The issue of whether you, the advice is still to stay at home. I see. You like, said about all the blind space in the. In the room. Yeah, so, but like, so the roadmap sets out the broad well, yeah, the, yeah, the broad framework uh, and, and principles, as you say, on which the advice and guidance is, is made available. Uh, and then we elaborate the detail of that at each of the stages. And we give ongoing considerations to whether there are any measures that we think need to be taken, for example, to bring forward a measure, or for example, to change our view in terms of how things are provided for in terms of phasing. We say that all along we keep. We don't see the roadmap as a rigid constitution, but as a, uh, if you like, um, uh, a broad framework to, to, to base our decisions on. And the detail of then those decisions we set out in the specific guidance. So there'll be a lot more detail in respect of various different measures than is in the document that is the roadmap. And um, we obviously have a considerable testing capacity now, but we're using just a tiny fraction of it. Did you today make any decisions on how you might uh, make use of all that capacity that we have? So we do. We did make some decisions in relation to that, and we do want to be able to do some additional testing uh, in in particular um, uh, settings that make best use of that particular uh, um, um, available capacity, not just in terms of testing, but in terms of sampling and so on. Uh, and in particular, to reflect on um, uh, the residential care facility sector, in particular nursing homes, and to reflect on hospitals. And we're giving uh, advice both to HC and government in relation to that, and we're giving ongoing consideration to the nature of that. And we also want to do some additional work to look at what is an evolving position internationally in relation to um, the science and evidence behind aerosolized transmission. Okay, so, so when, all of those things. When will be we be apprised of? So once, we, so once, once we have conveyed those decisions, uh, to government, the government make decisions on them. It's separate from the roadmap. Separate, I mean, the roadmap decisions are being made in the next week. Yes, but it's a, yes, absolutely. But it's all part and parcel of the same set of advice. Yeah, all, all the same output of today's meeting, in fact. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Graff, I'm a journalist. I'm really just got in touch to ask about visiting to end of life care facilities. I'm not sure about that to answer this, but. They asked that their uh, mother was at a level two end of life facility, and they wanted to know whether the National Public Health Information Scheme would recommend visits in controlled instances for families of people who are in these kind of facilities. I was wondering what the advice is for that, and clarify maybe what that advice is now, whether that could change into the future. And so there's already advice in place in relation to that, and visiting people in very compassionate grounds, and so it's not something that's completely forbidden. Uh, or, or recommended against. And there's a provision for some advice and guidance in relation to that. We've given further consideration to the whole question of visitation of people in, in nursing home and other residential uh, settings, and that forms part of the advice and guidance we've given to government today. Um, and we will uh, be in a position if government uh, makes it, its decisions on in relation to all of this, they will send for that tomorrow. Is it we can expect to update on end of life visiting uh, tomorrow? Yeah. Um, you can expect an update on all the things we have advised on tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Kleen, if I could ask you first, sorry, Woods, apologies to my doctors in front of me. Dr. Woods, 
Um, can I ask you, Liam Woods, uh, about public beds? Um, because there is some concern that, you know, obviously people have other health complaints that are to do with COVID. Where are we in terms of the amount of public beds that will have to be closed because of infection controls in a ward? Or are we going to have a number of public beds closed? What are the agency doing with that? So at the moment, there are uh, over 700 and 783 is the number of beds that are at the moment vacant in the public system. Uh, the beds close, uh, and that's the number that's been falling. That, that was up to 2,200 if you go back some weeks. So more and more beds have been occupied. And it's important to remember most of the beds in the public health system are occupied by people who do not have COVID who are attending for other reasons related to other uh, conditions. And that continues to be the case and increasingly so. And we are recommencing some activity around non-essential work following the decision of NEVIT back at the start of May, the 5th of May. So the use of the public capacity is increasingly for what it would have been used for pre-COVID. Empty beds, to deal with your specific point around infection control, there are very few beds at the moment empty because of infection control. There are fewer beds allocated to COVID right now. And if we have a, you know, a six bed area, and there are three people who are COVID. The other three beds may be closed, but there are very small numbers. So our main priority now is to provide COVID care, but also uh, following the decision of that at the beginning of May to recommence other non-essential uh, treatment and surgery. Um, and just Tony, if I could ask you, I mean, it's pretty clear that we're going to be um, going into phase two on Monday. Do you have any worries? Do you have any concerns about going into phase two and about complacency? Uh, in general terms, um, uh, the population has, has stayed with us and stayed with the public health advice. Uh, we have seen some episodes and some examples, and they're definitely something that would give us cause for concern in general terms of the area. So we know and we know the good data on this, obviously, but anecdotally, I think we all know probably from our personal lives and, and so on. House parties, uh, house parties being organised uh, with abandon, it seems to me, uh, as though we weren't in. in of the pandemic. So that's a continuing cause for concern, irrespective almost of the phase that we're in. There wouldn't come a point in time where we think certain activities that are indoor in nature can happen uh, in controlled ways and so on. But really not at the point now where we think that house parties and gathering indoors uh, is appropriate. Uh, and as we move through the phases, our advice will change and hopefully as we ease the restrictions, we will ease, if you like, the requirements in terms of indoor gatherings. But we're really not at a stage where those kinds of activities can Happen. I know a lot of focus has been on some of the external and public gatherings on beaches and platforms and so on, and dark stations and such places. And those give us cause for concern. Uh, but it's the unseen, I think, um, uh, activity in, 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 in ordinary houses. Very hard, very easy to understand. But we're really not at a point where we think that kind of activity is something we can recommend. So it's just one example of continuing concern that we would have around where public behaviour, if you like, is getting ahead of where our advice is. In the main, though, I still stress that all the data that we have uh, and all the impact on disease that we can see is telling us that the public is staying with us for the most part. Uh, and the disease conditions are such that we can uh, make recommendations uh, of the kind that we're in a position to make uh, around these restrictions. And just briefly on those house parties, people who would have them have gatherings in their homes, they might say, well, look, we, we've all been at home in our house for the last few weeks. We haven't been out working, maybe we've been working from home. The children have been off school or whatever. And we're going to a house where people have also been at home. So we don't see a risk by going to those houses because we haven't put ourselves at risk. So, and they may make those assessments, but that's not a public health assessment. That's people, uh, um, uh, if you like, I think rationalising and getting ahead of the kind of behaviour that we're recommending. And I'm conscious that it'll appear to people as though we're uh, trying to identify every sort of part of pleasurable activity uh, in, in, in life and finding some ways of recommend, recommending against it. Um, individual personal behaviour, intimacy, house parties, all of these things are things we're recommending against. Uh, but there are really good public health reasons why we think now is not the time for some of these activities to happen. And I have sort of two messages. One is to people who are organising these events. That's one thing. There's a responsibility. Uh, but then there are also people who voluntarily attend them. And you can choose not to. And I think we'd be increasing our advice, if you like, around the importance of recognising uh, recognizing the conditions that can lead to spread. So in other words, when you're out and about, 
uh, when you're invited to things or whether you, you, you attend things, to recognize uh, what, what crowded spaces look like. It seems like a simple thing to say. If you see a crowd, stay away. If you're invited to something which is crowded, stay away. If you're invited to something that you know is not in keeping with the public health advice, stay away. Okay, thanks, Shane. Thank you very much.